on this. Welcome again to our second session of the Art History Crafts Course, focusing on art and artists of the African diaspora. My name is Dimitri Brockton. I'm the Senior Director of Education at MOAD. And before we, we jump in with uh, Dr. Francis, I just want to um, just quickly say that MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We mourn the senseless death of so many um, and that number just keeps moving. So we wanna acknowledge those, say their names, um, and just take, a, just take a moment to think about that, especially in the context of this class. We also want to acknowledge that even though we are in digital space, our, um, our museum, our physical location, and even the network servers that we are on are on indigenous land. And Moad thanks the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land for generations. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Jacqueline Francis. Oh, I actually have one more thing before Jackie. Um, I did say that I was gonna send notes out to folks. We had over 251 participants. Unfortunately, I couldn't send that many um, emails to all of you without a uh, going to spam through my email, but we will continue to put the links to all the videos and articles in chat um, on both the Zoom and on Facebook. Um, so I just wanted to say that. All right, Jackie Francis. Hey, welcome back everybody. Good to see you all in a uh, virtual space and see people participating on the chat. Um, as I did last week, I just wanted us to sort of settle for a moment. I know how it is when we're all running around really busy and, um, you know, maybe just logging in right at the stroke of 6 p.m. Pacific time. So let's start off by just kind of grounding for a minute and literally feeling your feet on the floor and literally feeling maybe your fingertips on your lap if you're sitting down or by your sides if you're standing up like I am. Just taking some of the tension out of your shoulders. Maybe a few rolls will do that. Maybe moving your neck a little bit, just side to side, not going 360. Maybe side to side, front to back, but not doing a 360. And lastly, just being aware of your breath coming into your nose out of your nose. And maybe two last breaths, one into your nose and then out through your mouth. And then another into your nose and out through your mouth. Great. I hope everybody feels a little centered or more centered. Namaste, Peggy W. Forbes. So, um, you know, last week we started off by thinking about some key terms. And today, if Dimitri wants to put up the title slide against the green black background, I hope this is better for folks than the white background I used for the slides last week, but we can, Dimitri, share your screen and I'll ask you to drive. Great. So this week, what I would like us to think about are um, how artists are studying the African diaspora so um, we're looking at a lot of artists who um, were alive during the 20th century and some might be still alive in the 21st century. 
and the ways in which this idea of the diaspora, which we often think um, is something that is passed down literally from person to person, and it is um, within families, um, wherever the diasporic origins are from, from people moving from one place to the other, but sharing their knowledge with another generation or maybe with contemporaries in the new place where they arrive. Um, there's oftentimes we don't realize that it's about study and it's about the transfer translation as well as the um, transmission of knowledge that it is not in my belief that it is not simply through the blood. Um, it is not simply through DNA, it's through very active, um, active um, and intentional um, efforts that knowledge is transformed. And that includes knowledges of making, of creative making. So um, let's go to the uh, keyword slide, which is the second one, please, Dimitri. So I just wanted you to see this list of some words that I'll be talking about with you today um, in terms of things that might be um, key not only to the artworks, but also to the scholars um, and the people who have studied them. So Dimitri, there's a, there's a, um, there's a request that um, you, um, make the slides a little bit bigger because we're yeah, seeing- Yeah, I'm trying to figure out, hold on one second. Okay. It's on the no wrong worries. display. No worries. I think maybe that's it. All good. Does that help? Is that better? Yeah. And I wonder if there's like, oh yeah, you see those little bars? Maybe, I don't know if you can do it. I know I can. There's a, like little grab bars. Better for everybody? Okay, good. Thank you, Dimitri. So um, yeah, some of these words are definitely about practice, that is to say the creative practice, the artistic strategies, such as found objects, mixed media, um, even genre, the decision in which um, format an artist decides to work in. And others are sort of um, words that are about um, concepts, such as authenticity, which we know, you know, means something about something being um, true or genuine to what we think the origins are. Um, the idea of memory, which is everywhere in both um, visual art as well as literature and music. People talk about either trying to access memory or to use memory as a starting point for the artwork, whether it's narrative or it can be even abstract. Um, and then the big ideas such as, you know, what is art, um, you know, and uh, teacher of mine said to me in graduate school that art is simply um, the sharing of a creative idea. I think a lot of times we argue about when we say what is art, I think we're often arguing about what is good art and what is bad art. And I think that in itself is a, is a question of not only taste and culture and history, but it's also something that we forget that um, whether an artwork is something we like or we dislike, it's still an artwork. So sometimes we forget to use the adjective before it, which is that's good, or maybe that's not so good in my opinion. And then these broader questions about history and experience. So hopefully this will become self-evident as I'm talking through um, this discussion of artist study of um, the idea of an African diaspora. So if we can go to the third slide, please, Dimitri. So, um, this uh, work by the uh, London-based artist uh, Yinka, Yinka Shoni Barre is one that um, uh, Dimitri and the team at MOAD used in order to advertise um, this webinar, this uh, crash course. So I said, oh, well, we have to include it in the discussion. And the artist's name is uh, Yinka Shoni Barre, um, who was born in uh, London, but as some of you might know, um, spent uh, some of his uh, childhood in his parents' homeland, which is um, Nigeria. But I, before we get to that biographical um, matter of uh, Shoni Barre's sort of crisscrossing back and forth 
um, between the European and the um, African continent. Um, I just wanted us to look at this work because it's a good um, example of mixed media. That is to say, um, as some of you might know, um, an artist who's doing something with different kinds of materials. Um, so here, um, um, a fiberglass mannequin um, atop um, um, a globe that's been specially made for um, this artist project. Um, and the mannequin is wearing Dutch wax printed uh, cotton textiles. Um, so looking at this, you know, we might wonder, especially when we see the title Girl on Globe, um, the date of production is 2011. You know, what is Shoni Barre <laughs> um, trying to do here? Um, oh, and Catherine already has a question um, about CBE. Yes, commander of the British Empire, which is um, Shoni Barre's not only title given to him uh, by the queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, but one he insists on being after his name whenever he's exhibiting or even in terms of any kind of press. Um, so that'll tell you a lot about who Shani Barre is and also what he thinks is important in terms of his self-presentation um, to the world. So um, in terms of the subject matter with this particular uh, 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 work, this mixed media sculpture here by Shani Barre, um, you know, this idea of a girl, um, you know, being signified perhaps because of the dress and maybe the shape of the body. Um, but what is um, so uh, dramatically obvious is that there's no head to this mannequin. And this is something that we see in, in a lot of Shani Barre's work um, uh, in which he has uh, in some ways tried to de-individualize the subject to make the subject generic. That is to say, to have the subject have perhaps some personality, but to be um, less specific around something like expression, um, shape, the face, um, uh, the physiognomy of the, the, the top of our bodies in terms of hair and ears. And, and Dimitri is absolutely right in the, um, in the in the uh, chat saying it speaks to much of the body of uh, Shani Bari's work. Um, uh, Myra is uh, saying that about the lack of consciousness in a world in the world wandering without thought. It's really interesting because here's this girl on a globe and we might think of um, sort of European iconography where um, Atlas is holding up the globe and here is um, a, um, a figure who is seemingly almost um, dancing on the ball, um, but balancing somehow. The thing is with this project that Shoni Barre um, is exploring and there are a series of works of figures um, on globes is he's thinking about the precarity of our current times. That is to say, um, not only the cultural um, and the political, but also, of course, the environmental. And the idea that, you know, in a time where we're talking about, you know, climate change, um, the shifting of um, climates, the rising seas, is that, you know, we should be thinking about children um, who are the future, who are inheriting the earth from us, much as we inherited this earth from our parents and our grandparents. So there's a way in which this is a very serious matter. Um, the heat in the north of the globe, yes, Carrie. And exactly, Maria, it's, it's unclear as whether she's dancing or she's bracing for a fall. There's something about it that's kind of playful because there's an idea that a child could be toying with a globe, toying with a toy globe, or even the kinds of globes that you used to see in school rooms where you know, it'd be something that you could spin and play around with as well as learn geography. Um, I think the other thing too is that um, we should think about the fact that this child not only um, is um, not dressed um, in uh, what we would think about as contemporary clothes, but look at what she's um, dressed in, in terms of the boots and the stockings and those kind of skirts are supposed to be um, recognized by us as not of the present. And I think Shoni Barre hopes that we might think about them as being of a pre 20th century era and specifically um, the choice of clothing that he has um, that is uh, um, uh, made for these sculptures um, and these mannequins in particular are Victorian era clothes. So this is a time when we think about um, change in the world, the Victorian era, the reign of Queen Victoria from the middle part of uh, the 19th century 
into uh, the latter part of that century, um, a time of the Industrial Revolution. And I think he wants us to think about the kind of shifts in the 19th century um, going into the 20th century, which is seen as you know the amazing technological century and the sort of shifts that we're going through now in the 21st century. Um, Julie says, my eye keeps replacing the globe for a head and vice versa. Fantastic observation, Julie. The idea is, you know, we think of the head as um, something that is more or less round. And I think he is playing for that. It's a great, great observation. And I, again, think about the artist, you know, kind of strategic decisions, right? Um, what if he had decided um, not girl on globe, but maybe girl on map? What if he had made this figure stand on a flat map that was displayed or deployed on the museum floor or the gallery floor? Um, fantastic um, uh, Carmen notions that it's not a real geographical world, but it looks hot. So the choice of color, exactly sun. Um, I noticed from Remy this idea of um, the orb in the sky that brings light and heat. Um, and of course, the globe that is warming. Um, Darlene asked, yeah, that he calls it girl is so interesting as opposed to woman. Um, is there a reason why the globe is nondescript? That is a fantastic question. You know, there are continental masses on that, um, on that globe that he has had um, made for him by a special factory, but he doesn't want us to read it in the same way that we see globes and we've come to sort of um, uh, we've uh, digested a map of the world in our heads. Like when we, when someone says globe, right? We think of a certain kind of globe that has certain kinds of map representations on it. And oftentimes, right, those map representations, just like any form of representation, aren't exactly what the scale should be relative to the actual continental or land mass. That is to say, um, when you look at the old maps, um, what they used to call um, the um, Mercator maps. Um, and these are maps that uh, go back centuries to um, the time of exploration. Europe is always centered in these two dimensional maps and it always looks disproportionately large in relationship to say Africa or even um, Asia. And that of course is a subjective decision by the uh, map makers. Um, connections to Antoinette saying um, that he calls it girl in relation to, as opposed to woman. Yes, that is again, wanting us to think about youth, wanting us to think about generation. Um, and there is a strong alliteration, um, Sean, girl on globe, as opposed to woman on globe. Um, exactly right. Um, uh, Marla says her posture on the globe sets up an expectation of instability and motion. Yeah, that kind of precarity. And I would even say not only the posture in terms of the sprawling, but like one foot as opposed to um, both legs sort of straddling the globe. Fantastic. Ricky is saying, yeah, it's, it's interesting how I'm automatically orienting this as north and south, as we call it, like she would be standing in Northern Europe, but that speaks to assumptions exactly. Exactly. And this idea of kinetic motion. Yeah. So there's a sort of playfulness to it. Great. So let's look at um, the next slide, um, Dimitri. And in this one, we can see the artist. So just so you look at uh, this quote, which um, was published in an, uh, um, an interview with uh, Shoni Barre, and I'll let you read that. So here's this word authentic, which we mentioned as a key word, right? And yeah, Antoinette, the notion of culture as an artificial construct. Yes, that is the artist in a wheelchair. Um, when he was a teenager, he got um, myelitis, 
you know, and anything with an itis, it means inflammation. Um, so this was an inflammation of the spine and he's been um, par paralyzed since then. And he um, uses a wheelchair um, to, um, to get around more easily. Um, he nonetheless went to art Art school. Um, he, like I mentioned, um, he was born in London. He went uh, to Lagos um, when he was young, like around five years old, and he was there until he was about 17. He comes back to England, he comes back to London, he gets myelitis, but he goes to art school. Um, he, um, he earned um, an, uh, uh, a BFA from a college in London called the Byam Shaw College of Art, and then he received um, the M his MFA, Masters of Fine Arts, from a school some of you might know, Goldsmiths, which is um, related to the University of College London in 1991. Um, Julie says, it's interesting to show us the portrait after the globe piece, so we don't necessarily impose the lens of the wheelchair on our interpretation of the piece. Yeah, I wanted to sort of hold back. Um, yes, Crosby talked about this a few years ago. Um, at MOAD, um, she said that the heritage cloth was something that she played with by adding in imagery from contemporary fashion magazines. Yes, yes, and um, a lot of you who know um, about the ways in which um, cloth in Africa is um, a dynamic tradition which, uh, with certain kinds of decoration that can be very traditional in terms of Sankofa or other sort of themes of um, proverbial things in terms of unity and families, etc. Um, you might also have seen cloth produce even back to say um, Bill Clinton's administration. I remember seeing Kente with Bill Clinton's um, face stamped on it um, when he traveled to Africa. Um, and this idea of authenticity um, for Shoni Barre, that this idea of the Dutch wax um, method of treating um, fabric, that is to say, um, the way that stamped um, um, emblems and stamped designs are placed on fabric. You know, we might think of those things as African because of certain kinds of color patterns, maybe even the sort of cotton cloth. And what he's saying is, even these kinds of textiles as materials have a very complex history in terms of where they were made, where they were produced, where they are worn and used. And he says he really likes that complexity in terms of thinking about um, not only how things are made, but again, how they're perceived. And that's something that he loves to play with. He loves to play with what we expect things to be and then tries to make us think about, oh, well, actually, that is not the historical factual truth of the way they were manufactured in Europe to be sold in Indonesia, and then ultimately were sold in Africa after they were rejected in Indonesia. So there's a, um, a video clip that's just about four minutes, uh, four and a half minutes, and um, Dimitri has it queued up for us to watch. For me, art is a form of artifice and it's make believe. You know, so if I want to mix sort of, you know, 19th century with uh, medieval, um, you know, I can do that as an artist because I'm taking you to places that don't exist anyway in the first place. I don't see myself as trying to tell, you know, some kind of truth story. I mean, in a way, actually, you know, with art, you know, it's the biggest kind of lie ever. I grew up in Lagos and I, my interest in art began there. And I used to go to children's art workshops at the weekend. And, you know, and I did see the works of a lot of Nigerian artists when I was, um, when I was young. Then I came to art school, you know, uh, in London and my idea of art sort of changed. I guess I had exposure to you know, pop art, conceptual art, um, you know, the kind of art I'd never seen before, performance art. And then, you know, I started to actually relate history, philosophy uh, to the making of art. My work got very political in my second year and I was making work about perestroika, which is what was happening in Russia at the time. You know, and one of my teachers said to me, you know, why are you making work about what's going on in Russia, why aren't you making authentic African art? 
And so the whole question around the issue of authenticity actually began from that point on. And I wondered what stereotypes were about and, you know, uh, where do we get this idea that something has to be authentic? And then, you know, that's where my question around that issue began. History itself, we know, is very subjective anyway. And history is always written from the point of view of the people with power. And, and that then is uh, put forward as the authentic point of view. Um, but of course, we all know that it's all about power. That's what history is. 19th century interiors, for me, evoke a kind of colonial era. And, you know, so in a way, there is a kind of intrusion that I like into those spaces. It's almost like trying to reverse time. Uh, because I perhaps wouldn't have been allowed to go into those places or even, you know, eat in those places or socialize in those places. I'm now able to actually enter those spaces and in a way talk back to that history. And I think that's what my work is doing. It's sort of trying to have some kind of conversation with that relationship, you know, my own, my own history and my own background. You know, how do I speak back? I was exploring Oscar Wilde's uh, picture of Dorian Gray, but I also wanted to touch on the issue of uh, mortality, uh, the body, and the first work in which I explicitly explored my own physical disability too. Uh, and um, and I felt that that story um, was a you know was a good story to explore. And I think within the art world, there's a kind of Jim Crow thing that kind of goes on. You know, there are places you're supposed to go to, there are places you're not supposed to go to. And I refuse to do that, you know. I can go anywhere I like. Um, I can go, I can touch any part of um, art history. And I don't feel that I have to kind of, you know, go back to a village in Africa or something, you know. I mean, I can do whatever I like. All of this stuff is about, it's political stuff about agency, you know. And I think, you know, it's great to to know and to see the works of, um, you know, Kara Walker, Fred Wilson, you know, over the years. And it's a kind of empowerment that artists have only been able to have, I would say probably in the, in the past, maybe 50 years, if that. But it's great that, that a lot of artists, you know, of African origin, African-American artists are actually, you know, taking control of their own expressions and, they're, they're, and also interrogating that sort of uh, violent and oppressive history. You know, but we've got a long way to go. I mean, you know, I think so. I think that actually, you know, we're only just getting started. So how do people take that in? What are your opinions of, now that you've heard the artist speak, you can throw it into the chat. My chat's got really quiet. Oh, here it comes, Peggy's. I know he can go anywhere. Yeah. Art world is like Jim Crow. Yeah. For sure. Cool. Wonder if Wiley Oh, Kehinde Wiley, that's a great question, um, among others, yeah. Yeah, he, um, thank you for the link as well, um, Dimitri. I'm thinking of Fanon from Martinique, Julie, his insistence on using CBE, yes. <laughs> yeah, his mention of Kara Walker, yeah. So yeah, he's a widely, um, um, exhibited artist. Um, one of the things, you know, he saw that they, um, of course, um, cited his um, his training at um, Goldsmiths in London. He was one of the generation of artists called the YBAs, Young British Artists. Um, I don't know if people have heard that acronym before or that full phrase, Young British Artists. So among his classmates were um, um, Damien Hurst, um, 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 trying to think of some other folks, 
uh, Damien Hurst, um, um, Chris O'Feely, um, very Tracy Eamon, exactly, Jenny Saville, great. Thank you very much, folks, for um, bringing that in. Um, yes, so these were these artists who were seen as absolutely bringing world attention to British art in a way that there hadn't been that sort of attention, even with um, artists like um, Lucian Freud. I think a lot of people might know his portraits or somebody like, um, uh, um, 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 trying to draw the um, artist who did a lot of the uh, uh, the bishop um, um, figuration, um, um, abstract, um, figurally abstract works. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Someone's going to remember it in a second for me. Yes, um, Bacon. Exactly. Thank you, Rula. Uh, uh, Francis Bacon. So, you know, these artists were saying, you know, we're going to do things that are conceptual. Not all of them were painters. They were working in photography. They were working in mixed media. They were working in installation. Um, they were working in um, video. Yes, so great um, uh, uh, challenges to the traditional genres of art um, and insisting that um, British art was something that was lively, that was new, that was avant-garde. And of course, very well timed with the rise of um, Tony Blair in Britain when he was talking about forget rule Britannia, think about cool Britannia in the 1990s. Um, um, Myra saying when he said artists make believe, I relate that to writers and how they do the same, talk back to history um, and are tied and are not just tied to their cultural background. Absolutely art that is talking back. So speaking that art is talking, talking back. Um, oh, Bridgerton. Yeah, everybody's been talking about Bridgerton. I have to check that out. Um, if we could go to the next slide, Dimitri. So here you'll see um, at least one of the works that you saw briefly in the video, The Diary of a Victorian Dandy, um, 1900 hours. So that's using the, um, the 24 hour clock. So that would be seven o'clock in the evening, um, a photograph done in 1998. So large scale color photograph, look at the dimensions of it. And we'll see another image of it that's a little bigger um, on the next slide. And um, next to it, another work done by um, uh, Shoni Barre um, at an early part of his, clear, uh, his career, untitled, but in parentheses, it's also known as ethnic. And I don't know, that just makes me laugh because what I hear there is that kind of working class slang instead of ethnic in the sort of very crisp pronunciations, ethnic, um, which I just fall out laughing. And look at the look at the pose he has in that um, in that in that photograph. Um, it is just the, the the epitome of smugness and of arrogance and of learnedness and and self pride. Um, and you know he is trying to embody those kind of um, images of authors and of statespeople, mostly statesmen, and of course, of aristocrats. Um, check out the quote there as well. Um, I love this, uh, I'm very Caribbean English, that gaze too, that gaze of looking back at you, which is also part of Diary of um, Victorian Dandy. The quote there, I'm interested in where people come from. I'm, I can't be defined uh, without the British colonial experience of my birth and background. I don't exist without it. My biggest preoccupation is with the idea of the universal humanism. We all influence each other. Can you imagine Picasso without African, African art? And we're gonna talk a little bit, I hope, about Picasso, if not today and um, next week's class and that idea of African art and his appropriation. Yes, Joseph, um, it's a different form of cultural appropriation that um, Shoni Barre is up to and certainly um, what other people have talked about. Anita, great point on um, Tony Blair. Absolutely, um, a neoliberal um, perspective in terms of the capitalization of the capital, capitalism iation of the British Empire, which you know started back um, with Margaret Thatcher. Um, so uh, the idea of where does dandy come from? Um, great question um, from, um, uh, from Myra. Yeah, I, we had a, a great uh, dandy show at uh, Moad a couple of years ago um, in terms of talking about the dandy as this, um, this paradigm of both style and attitude and confidence. 
So the idea of the dandy is um, someone who you know cares a lot about dress, and that dress can be not only in terms of fine clothes, but just a way of even putting together clothes that are simple and and yet um, make a style and visual statement. Um, Diary of a Victorian Dandy is currently on view at CAM. That's fantastic in LA. Great to know that it has another life. Um, Yes, Antoinette, ownership of dress and body, absolutely right. Um, let's go to the next slide. I think we can make C Dandy out a little bit larger if we go to slide number six, Dimitri. Yeah, great. So in terms of you know, Dandy, you know, what he's obviously trying to do is to evoke this upper class 19th century um, parlor you know, um, at seven o'clock in the evening where there would be music playing. Um, there would be a gentleman who is um, clearly in this um, image, um, the attention is all on him from the ladies in the room and even the admiring men in the background. You know, and he presents himself at the center of attention even as the image of him is slightly off center, but he wants you to see not only um, the space of this room, but the way he is shaping the room. That is to say, look at how all the heads turn toward him. There's like, it's like he's creating a world with just the pose gestures that he's obviously directed, just like a theater director or a film director um, to take the um, to tell the people who are also participating in this photo project with him. Oh yeah, Dimitri, could you give us the next slide? It's number six. It's the same one, uh, but it doesn't have the quote. Oh, something just skipped. One more back if we can. Oh, maybe it's different. Who knows? Okay, that's fine. Well, oh, that's great. Oh yeah, perfect. Oh, <laughs> there it is. Awesome, cool. So yeah, um, this idea of you know um, literally creating motion and creating a rhythm of motion as his head um, not only tilts and but the other heads tilt in response to his sort of um, prideful um, um, tilt of his head, um, which shows that he knows how important he is, as important as the um, single portraits. Um, behind him in terms of um, these large um, paintings with these elaborate frames um, of people who are presumably as important or were important um, to this estate or this place um, where this um, music time, uh, 7 p.m. in the evening is happening. Um, Dimitri, I don't know if uh, this is the last one of the Shoni Barre ethnic and Victorian dandy. Oh, Julie has a question about interested in the flaneur versus the dandy. Great question, Julie. Um, you know, when I think of the flaneur, which is this um, character that um, Baudelaire, the French writer talks about in um, the 19th century, I see someone who is, um, as the flaneur was, walking the streets of Paris. Someone who necessarily would not have been um, of the upper class, but the thing about the flaneur is that the flaneur is interested in urban life. And that need not be urban life at the top of the economic scale. It can be all forms of urban life as it's dramatically changing in the 19th century and is being seen as progress. Um, the uh, question that um, Julie has, the flaneur versus the dandy. The dandy can certainly be in the streets, but the also the dandy is um, someone who, um, I think would be positioned as not as self-aware as the flaneur. Um, the dandy would be seen as um, perhaps um, a little bit more self-involved, um, albeit for the joy of everyone who appreciates um, the dandy's um, attention to um, style as well. Um, there was a question, I'm gonna go back up to it because I don't wanna lose it. Oh, they're coming so great. I love the participation. And it was about, um, the, oh, here we go. Can you talk about from Veronica? Hey, Veronica, can you talk about how Shoni Barre has positioned himself as a standing figure as opposed to be wheelchair bound? Yes. You know, it was interesting because I don't think um, he's obviously sitting in the untitled photo ethnic, 
um, where you would not know that he had um, difficulties and challenges walking. And when I started looking at Shani Barre's work when I was in graduate school, I did not know um, that he was somebody who had trouble walking. And as a matter of fact, um, someone had told me that um, She'd seen him at a at a reception um, at the Studio Museum in Harlem, getting down on the dance floor, just absolutely tearing it up. But she said that at that point she realized that he um, had a little bit of a problem walking. I don't think he was entirely um, uh, um, confined to wheelchair in terms of mobility at that point. Um, I think he was still using crutches, and at one point I finally saw an image of him using the kind of crutches that um, that where the cuff comes up to your forearm to get around. But I do think that he is um, positioning himself in Diary of Victorian Dandy, which makes me think, I wonder if he's leaning on something um, in terms of to prop him up and how long he was able to stand up like that. And it is to show that the Dandy is this figure of verticality. Um, in a way that maybe the sitting figure would have to be positioned um, like ethnic is. So that's a really um, that's a really acute observation, Veronica, in thinking about how he's managing to show a certain kind of class position, even with the challenges of his own physical life, and the way he can work it in both ways. I think there's a couple more questions. Um, Yes, Catherine, the dandy needs wants to be seen. Um, somebody else said, um, think about Walt Whitman, absolutely, um, yeah, making um, his way through the streets of New York, the barbaric yawp of our American uh, poet of the 19th century. I see something from Dominique, the figure, the flaneur, the stroller, absolutely the passionate, wandering, emblematic of the 19th century, yes, has always been essentially timeless. He removes himself from the world while he stands aside its heart. Yeah, and I, I do think though with the flaneur though, is that the flaneur becomes, um, but not um, as um, distant from the world as say the romantic poets of uh, the, the 19th century, you know, the Byrons and um, the Coleridge's, et cetera, the Shelley's um, who seem to always be off um, either in the countryside or in um, the smaller and more, um, what should I call it? The more um, um, refined spaces that seem to be pushing against modernity, say in Italy, um, you know, you can think about um, all of that time that um, Shelley and others spent in, it in Italy. There is a very thin, yes, he does have a cane, but I can't believe Yvette that he's actually leaning on that cane, um, uh, but, but it's better than nothing. But it works, right? It's absolutely working with you know, his challenges physically as well as what he's trying to do. Yes, the noble rustic, exactly, thank you, Aimé. These terms are also impacting by class. Say more about that, Anita, in terms of these terms of the flaneur and the dandy and others. Um, the other thing I wanted just to mention to you as well is to think about the fact that um, not only is Shoni Barre doing these, um, these images to make you think about a certain kind of dandy um, in um, uh, British history, but he's also saying that this is not just him doing a sort of um, a, uh, a vaudevillian performance. He's also wanting you to think about the fact that these figures of African descent were in uh, uh, Britain as early as the 1500s in terms of um, uh, Black people being brought from Africa um, and brought to the, uh, to the British Isles. Um, there are even reports that Blacks were captured in Viking raids in Spain and North Africa as early as 862. So that's 862 years after the birth of uh, Christ. And certainly by the 1600s, there were Blacks who were um, coming to England as um, enslaved people um, by seamen and officers on board ships. Um, and there were Black people, people of African descent, um, working in England as servants. Um, there were Black people not only in the metropolitan area of London, but also in the English countryside and in Ireland and in Scotland. Um, so don't think that it's only about the metropole of London. Um, 
by the 18th century in Africa. Um, we know that, remember last week, we talked about um, some of the writers such as Equiano, who was writing about his life um, and uh, was talking about um, uh, surviving um, enslavement as well as um, Ignacio Sancho's, whose letters were published after his death. Um, in uh, the, I think it was uh, 1782, if I'm not misremembering. So I think what Shoni Barre wants us to think about is that it's not just about the idea that people of African descent came to England and to the British Isles in the 20th century, but also they have been there. And to insist upon that um, as um, a, a truth, a historical fact. I'm just gonna go up the chat because I did see some very interesting comments about um, the photographs as paintings in the, your imagination. Yes, he wants you to think about um, the sort of paintings of nobles and of aristocrats in um, the, uh, uh, the pre 20th century era, which would decorate halls and estates and great homes and um, townhomes in um, a metropolitan area of London. Yeah, Calendra, why are we always getting stolen? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the issues of enslavement and exploitation don't seem to uh, get any, um, don't ever seem to wear out, do they? Um, Merit, many in contemporary Nigeria still wear wigs. Yes, absolutely. You know, this that's a really good question, um, Merit. Is that a comment on contemporary Nigeria? You're absolutely right that that could be part of it as well, especially because Nigeria was a British colony. And throughout the, the British, um, the, the uh, former colonies of the United Kingdom, as well as the Commonwealth, um, that's these countries that still have um, um, a relationship with the United Kingdom, you will still see these kind of quaffed curly wigs on the judiciary, on um, the, the governor general um, in terms of places in the Caribbean, um, uh, to some extent in Asia as well, in um, Australia and other places where um, the British were imperial powers. Uh, Joy Well says of an exploitation let me see if I can scroll up here. A perversion of what value means. By the 19th century, Black people were major abolitionists in England. Yes, yes. Uh, the flaneur uh, can be an outsider based on class as opposed to romantics. Yes, exactly right. Um, these photographs are sized like large. Yes, Elizabethan painted portraits, exactly Veronica. And Yinka is, oh, he's an order of British empire. Yeah, he was a member of British empire. Then, it, well, no, first it was order of British empire. Then it was member of British empire. Then it was commander of British empire. So I guess, you know, he, he can still keep going further up the, uh, the, uh, the queen's honors. Um, I, I think he can become like Lord soon. Yes, Darlene, he continues to play with the complexity of notion of culture and authenticity, great. So let's look at um, the next slide. We can uh, switch back over to the other side of the Atlantic um, before we take the break. I know that it's um, 50 minutes past the hour now, great. So another image that was part of the marketing for this webinar was this um, study for a mural by the American artist, Aaron Douglas. Um, Douglas, uh, 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 somebody uh, recognized some Douglas work last year when we were talking um, about um, a text published in the 20th century. Douglas was born in um, 1899 and died in 1979. And what I want you to see here is the way in which Douglas is clearly somebody he's studying the idea of what is Africa and how he can convey it um, in this work. That is to say, what is the idea of um, African in terms of um, symbolism? Um, what is the idea of Africa in terms of um, certain kinds of even strategies of painting? Because this is a, um, a small study that was going to be developed into a mural painting, that is to say a wall decoration for a private home in Delaware. Um, what do we think about how Douglas has decided to represent and interpret Africa? What are the key kind of um, uh, visualizations and figures that he decides he's going to employ um, here?
Yeah, epic and theatrical. Yeah, there's something about it that seems grand. And I'm all, not only because of the, and the musical, yeah, Rula, um, in terms of the man playing the trumpet there, um, that certainly makes us think of musical, but there's something about that radiant and the concentric circles as well um, that makes you think like, ta-da! Yes, the Thunderbolt, Tiffany, fantastic, over there in the left, um, top left corner, the inescapable sun, the space, expansive like the continent. Yes, the industrial scenes, great eye, Ricky. Um, uh, steamships um, over here. This is supposed to be a factory at the bottom right corner, which are bel um, belching out smoke from their um, from their uh, their, uh, their 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 steam. What do you call those things? Stacks. Yeah, right. Yeah, stacks. Yeah, and then the square um, that um, someone just uh, drew a ten smokestacks, thank you, Joseph, um, is actually the way in which he imagined that this mural would be over a doorway. So he's blocked out the way that the mural would frame the doorway. Progress and future and hope. Yes, Diana, how is that being also translated as well? upward progress, yes, that these are standing figures and even the, the sitting figure is kind of pushing himself up. The strength of the woman, perhaps a machete in the hand, yes, the use of light, right? The muted cool tones, great Maria, the plants in the bottom left and then moving toward industry, right? So we have this, um, this image of a, a gear wheel there, which is of course the idea of the gear as progress. And you can think about um, Charlie Chapman's film uh, modern times, how the gear is always part of um, the idea of an industrial transformation, but one that is um, perhaps not always best to the workers lowest down on the on the food chain. Um, there's a great question I just saw. Hang on, I'm just scrolling back up. Um, one said, somebody said, yes, um, Joy, that it reminds you of Wananena's poems about images of Africa. Yes, there might be something here that even Douglas, how could he not um, have used the sort of archetypes of Africa? Um, somebody, Tiffany noticed mountain peaks, pyramids in the edge. Yes, that's supposed to make us think about um, North Africa, that Egypt as a place of great civilization, great architecture, um, the land of kings and pharaohs, et cetera. Um, and I also saw something here, um, lack of regional specificity. Yes, Rula, um, maybe suggesting all, uh, not suggesting all inhabitants of the African continent. Yes, so exactly right, that it's not just um, the sand of the Sahara, nor the vegetation of Central Africa, right? It's not the coastlines of Ghana, nor of um, Mad Madagascar as the island. Yes, it's a Pan-Africanism right? I'm um, not a single monkey or a lion in sight. Yes. And it is supposed to be about the majesty of Africa. Let's go on to the next slide. Great comments, great readings. Talk a little bit more about um, uh, uh, um, uh, Douglas. So you see here painting, um, um, uh, this is a late life um, photograph. I'm not sure of the date of it, but I would suspect it's somewhere after the 1950s um, easily. I wanted you to see this um, image of the artist at work or at least posing as if he's actively at work. I love um, when we see um, images of artists at work and they have on really nice um, clothes like he's got on his tie and his nice sweater vest. You know, you don't want to get paint on that. Um, but it's, it's for the camera, no doubt. Um, yes, look at the painting on his easel there. I just wanted you to see that a lot throughout his life, even though a lot of times we think about Douglas's work in terms of these images of um, an imagined and idealized Africa, a magisterial Africa, is that um, he often was commissioned to do figure um, paintings, um, things that were very realistic. And I want us to think about, I'm not saying realistic is better or worse than what he's doing. I'm just talking about they look like real people. And we're always talking about the um, uh, the idea of uh, the real as opposed to maybe even the naturalistic. Um, so this is a figure even that we can not see the entirety of the painting 
um, on the easel, but you can see that the figure seems to be um, in proportional representation, like the one to seven, the head is like one seventh of the rest of the body. Um, the figure's pose, even more than realistic, it's naturalistic. This looks like a person who's um, a dancer or an athlete um, that has um, um, uh, uh, stopped for a moment for movement. Um, there's musculature. So here's an artist, um, Douglas uh, went to uh, the University of Nebraska um, where he studied painting in the 1920s. Um, he was born in Kansas, if I'm not mistaken, and then studied in Nebraska and then came to New York um, where he was an often commissioned um, illustrator for um, black magazines like um, the NAACP crisis. And he also started to become um, uh, commissioned to do illustrations for books and other print materials, as well as continuing to do easel paintings on commission from um, private collectors and private individuals. So I just wanted you to see that because, you know, we don't think about um, not only the figure and the realistic, and in this example, the naturalistic figure being part of Aaron Douglas's oeuvre, but for the most part, that is the painting that the people of his time, the 1920s, the 1930s and beyond, actually enjoyed and wanted in their homes. There were some clients that wanted certainly these, what we might call modernistic, just because of the ways in which they um, summarize form, the image seems to come to the front of the picture plane they don't always use naturalistic color. Um, the, the market for those kinds of representations in terms of painting and illustration was very narrow and not just for painters of African descent. The vast majority of um, people in the United States really wanted work that was realistic, naturalistic and figurative and not so much of the kind of geometric figuration that we see here in this art deco um, inspired work by Douglas. Yeah, Veronica noticed that um, uh, Lynette Yadom Boyake looked to Douglas for inspiration. Yes, to Boyake bring us back to the figure, fantastic. Um, yeah, Maria, the cool tones, the multiple meanings of images and symbols. Um, uh, uh, is it Yeva or Yeva Johnson says, I love the photograph, yes. I'm thinking about art and authenticity. Yes, what is the authentic? And as we study these artists, learning more about um, the, uh, the particulars of their project. Yes, so Myra, yes, he made a lot of murals um, for public places, including um, with, when we can all go out again, um, places like uh, the Schomburg um, uh, Center for Research in Black Culture, um, which um, is a place that um, has um, a very famous mural series. They're actually um, canvases that have been placed on the wall. So he didn't oftentimes paint directly onto the wall, fresco style. Oftentimes he made large scale canvases. And there's one at the Schomburg Center that he made in the 1930s called Aspects of Negro Life. And there are four panels. And he did a ton of, um, ton of um, uh, murals for um, private individuals and a few for some um, commercial spaces um, um, like um, nightclubs and restaurants. Let's go to uh, the next slide, Dimitri, which, oh, something just got blocked out there. Um, I just wanted you to see the, um, the, uh, study that he did for um, the painting that is building more stately mansions. And I think there must be a highlight over it, which is why it's um, whited out there. But uh, some of you might remember that um, the, the painting on the right was, um, if we just jump down two slides, Dimitri, to slide number 12. Yes, um, you might remember that last week we talked about Paul Gilroy's um, book, um, uh, The Black Atlantic, um, and in which um, uh, uh, Gilroy really wants us to think about this idea of a Black Atlantic that's about crisscrossing, not only in terms of the historical slave trade, but even 20th century artists who are at least modern and in some works modernist, 
um, like Aaron Douglas in the 20th century. Um, so let's go back one slide to slide, two slides actually to slide 10, if you don't mind, Dimitri. Uh, yes, great. So I just wanted you to see um, how Douglas moves from the study to the finished painting. So the study there um, uh, is a little smaller than the finished painting uh, would turn out to be in uh, the bigger version. The big painting was 54 by 42. He does a study there that's um, 20 by 16. Um, what do you think in terms of the, the difference between the study of uh, the painting, the study for the painting, building more stately mansions and the finished painting to the right of it. What sort of things are, yes, Myro, what sort of things are there? He changed a few things. What are some of the things that change? What are some of the things? Yes, the crane, fantastic. The crane comes in. Um, thank you, Julie. What the man is holding. Um, there are guys with sledgehammers. There are men um, with seemingly holes. One guy seems to have a pitchfork in the study and um, in the finished painting seems to have a hoe. Yes, the color palette is stronger. It's hotter um, in the finished painting. Um, industrialization comes across very strongly with the crane. Um, great, the curving line is moved, right? You have this green line, which we see a lot of times in Douglas's work, including in um, the mural series called um, Aspects of Negro Life. One of the things we should know about um, Douglas is clearly, as um, Unjung has noted, he has he's thought about cubism. Um, and I think more than analytic cubism, he's thinking about synthetic cubism. So analytic cubism is developed by Picasso and Brock around 1909-1910. Um, the, the color palette is often mono, um, monochromatic. Um, for Picasso, it can kind of be a blue-green. For Brock, it's almost like a brown oftentimes. Um, but what they're often doing in that analytic cubism, exactly as um, Unjung is saying, is that they cut up the figure, they cut up the space. Um, I think when Picasso starts to move toward what is seen as a more synthetic cubism, he gets involved in the sort of silhouette, um, these things that look like they are of heavy volume and sometimes are flattened out in terms of mass. And I think Douglas is more influenced the, um, by synthetic cubism that's coming out of Western Europe than even analytic cubism. The analytic cubism aspect of it is definitely there in terms of the monochromatic palette. Um, but I don't think he's interested in breaking up forms. As a matter of fact, his silhouettes to me seem to always be about insisting that you see a form in its entirety. And you might think about the artist that we studied last week, um, Denise Tommaso, and how she broke up space. You know, this is the, the legacy of analytic cubism, um, whether you hate Picasso, whether you have an opinion about Brock or not, but cubism absolutely transformed the 20th century, at least among those people who um, studied in art schools and had formal training. Um, everything after 1909. Yeah, the horizontal um, squiggles suggest a fog. Yes, absolutely right, Ricky. So the other thing about Douglas that oftentimes is not talked about is that Douglas was a Communist Party member in the 1920s. Um, by the time of the Red Scare in the 1940s and 50s, he certainly tried to um, Dis distance himself from that political alliance that he had um, in his youth. But a lot of his paintings have these, if not outright critiques, they have these moments of questioning about capitalism and its exploitation of the worker, um, its influence on the environment, um, as well as the, um, the rapaciousness of profit um, in terms of what should be um, pursued at all um, length and the integrity of the worker exactly Sean is something that he wants to um, he wants to insist upon always um, being um, at the core of labor and progress, not the fat cats who are the ones scooping up 
um, the products of their labor. Um, there was a question, is that just about the industrial revolution? It's part of the industrial revolution. It's part about the exploitation of workers and mass production, but it's also about the sort of rise of capitalism. Was he influenced by the Mexican muralist or Rivera? Great question, Kim. You know, um, Douglas was in New York in the 1930s um, when Rivera came uh, to do the famous mural for uh, Rockefeller Center. And I'm pretty sure he would have known of, um, of Rivera. Um, and there's some kinds of stylistic, I think, um, similarities, um, figures kind of overlap, but you never see the sort of packed um, composition um, that you would see in somebody like um, uh, Douglas's um, Black um, contemporary, Charles Alston. You might want to look him up too. I'll type his name in the, um, uh, the, the uh, chat. Charles Alston and Hale Woodruff. You really see that these folks um, who were in New York, African-American painters like Douglas, were clearly looking at what Diego Rivera was doing at um, uh, Rockefeller Center. And I think Alston even talked to Rivera why he was doing that work um, at Rockefeller Center. I think Alston knew a little bit of Spanish and was able to converse with Rivera, who obviously knew some English as well. Yeah, great. More space between the structures, absolutely. Wondering about the influence of fauvism, yes, and the less natural color scheme. Great call, Donna. Um, you know, the thing about fauvism is it can be very hot. Um, and we see that in the in the finished painting of building more stately mansions. Um, but we don't see a lot of the impasto and um, the ways in which he's applying color to the canvas is pretty thin actually. Um, so maybe that's um, where he kind of breaks with those um, painters of 1905 um, who were called the fauvists, including Matisse. Yes, the children get bigger and so forth. The architectural spaces um, elements have more space. Great, great. So um, last slide, and then we should have like a quick stretch break, maybe just three minutes. Um, slide number um, 11. So the other thing I wanted you to see um, in terms of um, this study is that it sold uh, several years ago for um, $600,000 um, at auction. Um, the estimate was 100,000 to 150,000. And I'm just bringing this in because I, I know some people are always interested in thinking about the art market and especially the market for works by artists who are of African descent, including historical artists. Um, you know, the market is heating up, um, uh, even something that is not a finished work, but something that's preparatory, um, like Douglas's study for building more stately mansions has its audience. And, you know, $600,000, that's not too bad for a preparatory drawing, a preparatory painting, is it? Who received the money from the cell? I don't know where, I think it came out of a private collection. And of course, the auction house gets um, part of their, their cut as well. You know, that's often a secondary market um, when you see um, something coming in. Um, the auction house um, um, has to get their cut, which is going to um, often be at least 10 to 10 to 15 percent. Is there an Aaron Douglas estate? That's a good question, Veronica. I don't know. I don't know. There, there might be, but if I'm not misremembering, he did not, he and his wife Alta, I don't think had children, but I think there were nieces on his wife's side. Great question. All right, it's uh, 11 minutes after the hour, can we have a stretch minute break for three minutes? Just get some water and come back and then we'll talk for another 15 minutes. His nieces by marriage claim an estate, but there were no children. Thanks, Susan. Hey, Susan, there you go. Of course, you know that. Susan Earl, scholar of Aaron Douglas. All right, we're gonna have a quick break. Three minutes, we'll be back at quarter past the hour.
Okay, we're back. Dimitri's fixing a typo for me. Um, I love uh, what you found. Um, was it uh, was it Myra? Who was it that started to um, find a text with a Douglas reproduction on it? Um, was it uh, Calandra? Yes, great. You know, I'm really smiling because this is um, something that a lot of um, people who take art history classes do. Um, we call them unknowns. And literally, the more you see the same kind of um, image, um, the same kind of style by an artist or maybe a school of artists, um, the more familiar you are with the movements um, and the techniques, obviously, as well. So oftentimes on an, an exam in an art history class, there'll be a section called unknowns where the, the instructor will show you something that you haven't seen in class, that you hadn't seen in the book, whatever you're using for reading, and, and you should be able to recognize it. So I'm absolutely tickled that you um, pulled that out, Calandra. Now you'll be able to recognize an Aaron Douglas from across the room <laughs> or uh, across the bookshelf. All right, let's go back up, Dimitri. Thank you for fixing that um, typo for me in uh, the last slide to slide number 13, please. So um, showing you a photograph of a contemporary artist, David Hammonds, uh, born in Springfield, land of Lincoln, uh, but now uh, lives in New York City, um, spent some time in the uh, 60s here in California because he went to art school um, in LA at what was then Otis College of Art, um, and then uh, moved to New York in the 70s. Um, I want to draw your attention. Actually, could you go to, yeah, um, go to slide 13, Dimitri, is there one before that? Yeah, that's the one I want. Thank you so much. Um, before we look at the photograph of Bottle Trees by Eudora Welty, just this quote by, by David Hammonds, which will give you a sense of his sensibility. Um, So this is from uh, Kelly Jones, uh, my colleague at uh, Barnard College in New York, um, Guggenheim, uh, not Guggenheim, a uh, uh, MacArthur Genius Fellow, um, who did some of the earliest um, um, writing about Hammonds' extraordinary work, um, his work as a conceptual artist, that is to say somebody who's interested in um, working with the idea of things rather than the making of things as craft in which you can show, oh yes, I can draw a figure true to life, or I can sculpt a form that makes you think of motion. You know, there's something about Hammonds's work that's always about the idea and sometimes um, it can even be humorous. Um, this photograph that you see of here of him here on the left, um, taken by his friend Dawu Bey, who had a show at SF MoMA here in San Francisco um, uh, last year. Um, I think it was uh, curtailed a little bit um, toward the end um, because of the uh, the pandemic and the shutdown. Um, took this photograph of Hammonds in his studio in 1984, and you know what I think we're seeing above him are. Um, like little flask of some sort. Um, so one of the things that we wanna think about with Hammonds is his use of um, material that's already been made, things that are um, mass produced, things that may be seen as detritus or throwaway things, things that don't seem like the um, materials for traditional art. So with, if that was um, sculpture, it would be wood or marble. If it was painting, we'd be thinking about um, the canvas or um, the, the things that you put on the canvas, like oil or acrylics. For um, Hammonds working in the 20th century, you know, he's like, all that stuff has been done. Why do I wanna mix around, mess around with 2D um, formats like painting? I wanna do things that are about experience, 
um, with something in installation in an, and in a different way than we experience art through painting and sculpture. Um, but look at the way he, um, in his absolutely um, signature way, I hate art. This is a guy who went to art school. This is a guy who um, has been a sort of maker all his life and a thinker. Why is he saying I hate art? Other than being curmudgeonly even when he was only 43 years old in 1986. What is the thing that he hates? Yeah, the idea of the art market. Thank you, um, Marla. The idea of the art market, the idea of, although he participates in the art market, talking about um, people doing well in the art market, he's doing very well and has been doing very well for several decades now. Um, I read, I think this is probably 15 years ago that, um, that David Hammond sold a drawing at auction for $900,000. And it was worth every penny considering the other ones, uh, the, the way the market is. He's talking about the art market. He's talking about the sort of elitism of the idea of artworks and some things being high art, um, as well as um, some stories of artists never being discussed um, in mainstream um, narratives of what exceptionalism and what achievement is. So that's what he's saying. And he's saying, I hate the kind of fustiness of the art world in terms of, you know, exhibition openings and receptions, etc. So I got 28 new mentions just about this. Yes, art has so many barriers attached to what's considered art, what gets considered good, who gets to make it, absolutely. Um, the artifact, artification of creativity. Yes, Ed, Eric McKissick, hey, um, his, his um, performance work in which he sold snowballs on the streets um, in lower Manhattan in order to think about what does it mean to commodify um, creativity, fantastic and pretension, great, absolutely. So if you hit the advance um, button, thank you for me, um, Dimitri, um, you know, the thing about um, uh, Hammond is he's also saying, I want to think more about other forms of artworks, other objects. And I'm showing you this photograph, hey, Sita, um, <laughs> of, um, uh, from Eudora Welty's um, um, photographic Irv, and you can hit advance again, um, Dimitri. Um, this is um, a photograph that she took in uh, sometime during the Depression era of uh, bottle trees in Mississippi. Um, and bottle trees are yard art, um, as they've been called, um, where people are using things, um, objects that would ordinarily be um, tossed away as detritus, as no longer useful, um, and are um, creating not only these works that are sculptural in terms of working with nature, but also um, that have a spiritual and ritual and historical cultural meaning in terms of the idea of the bottles being either things that can protect the space of the house and the yard or contain spirits within them. So we think about the bottle as a vacuum and that something gets in and then can't get out. Um, I, I uh, want you to keep thinking about the bottle tree as something that we're going to see over and over again. Um, not only in terms of um, documentation like um, Eudora Welty's, but also in some um, more contemporary um, uh, uh, works of art. So let's go to the next slide, Dimitri. Great. So, you know, um, if, uh, if Hammond's hated art, or hates art because he's still alive and well, doing pretty well. I'm happy to hear that. Um, he has company in the um, uh, historical artist, Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp died in 1959, so he's long gone. Um, Hammonds cannot, even as he starts to study things like 
bottle trees to make art in the 1980s. He is clearly somebody who's come out of art school and knows the work of Marcel Duchamp. Uh, Duchamp leaves Europe like many Europeans in um, the interwar era when it was clear that World War II was in the offing and comes to New York and is a kind of cause celeb um, among the, um, the growing um, New York art world um, in the 1940s and 50s. Um, again, he died in 1959. Um, when we think about what um, uh, 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 Duchamp is doing in this work called Bottle Rack, also known as Bottle Dryer, also known as Hedgehog, he's taking something that is a a thing in the world that is useful, um, that is instrumentalized. That is to say, um, you know, you could put empty bottles after you have finished the wine or vinegar or oil on them onto these little prongs. Then you dry, they dry out, they air out, and then you take them back to the vendor who, you know, in up until, you know, the early 20th century would then refill it with wine or refill it with vinegar, refill it with oil. So some of you might know the term, yes, thank you very much, Eric, that Duchamp talks about. He talks about his work as ready-mades. That is to say the idea that for Duchamp was anybody can make painting and make painting that looks um, illusory in terms of presenting the illusion of a three-dimensional space. He says to him, being an artist in the 20th century is about the idea. And that is what conceptual art is. It is about the idea ahead of the making of things. So if Hammonds um, hated art, um, it was because he felt like artists should have become, have moved beyond this idea as well of art as craftsmanship, even though he's a fantastic draftsman. Um, and he's a brilliant maker as well as we're gonna see in a second. But he's also saying the most important thing that an artist does is an artist brings ideas to the public and ideas of what um, that sort of prick your brain that make your brain kind of sparkle. Um, if we hit uh, advance, yes, we see the photograph here of um, Duchamp in the corner there. Uh, I just wanted you to see what Duchamp looked like in this um, Irving Penn photo um, from his time in uh, New York. And then go to the next slide, Dimitri. Thank you. So, um, you know, this idea of um, using what's around and being playful with it. Um, you know, I think this is also something that comes from Duchamp with Hammonds, although I'm sure Hammonds would never admit it because, you know, Hammonds is trying to say, you know, Eurocentric narratives of art are just already too dominant and I'm trying to get away with them. So the example of this is, um, of course, um, Duchamp's famous, um, um, uh, uh, um, appropriation of a, of a print, a reproduction of, um, of uh, the Mona Lisa, um, in which he scribbles a mustache on uh, the uh, uh, upper lip and a goatee of, um, you know, the famous sitter, uh, La, La Jaconda, um, the uh, wife of um, uh, Jacondo, um, who commissioned this portrait. Uh, by Da Vinci. So uh, I didn't spell out, I forgot to do that, uh, uh, what those initials mean if anybody um, here is a French speaker or maybe has studied this in um, their art history survey. So for us, the English speakers, the title of the Duchamp work is L-H-O-O-Q. Anybody remember this from their art history survey and why this is another kind of jokey work of art? Yes, Charlie. El a asho cool. Maria Porges, yes, bing, bing, bing. It means she has a hot ass. So Duchamp taking this, um, this, 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 this icon of Renaissance painting, scribbling a mustache and a goatee on it um, and calling it L-H-O-O-Q in the first English speakers. But if you say it fast in French, L-H-O-O-Q, it sounds like L-A-H-O-Q. 
include she has a hot ass. Um, so being um, um, absolutely um, irreverent, um, 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 uh, sexist, <laughs> um, and uh, also as well, um, you know, iconoclastic in a way. Diana also run the letters together and the word is look, look at what I've done to the most famous and beloved work in European art, fantastic. So I put this next to um, Hammonds's work, um, an untitled work, but in parentheses, it's been referred to as Night Train. And he too likes linguistic play. Um, because as some of us know, you know, Night Train is a uh, common name in terms of cheap wine uh, that you can get like Thunderbird, inexpensive alcohol. And he cleans out these bottles and that's why I showed you the bottle rack before the hedgehog, um, because I think that this is something he's thinking about and he's being, again, very resourceful in terms of his use of the ready-made. And then he puts this ring of bottles on this pile of coal, which makes you think about ideas like coal um, yards where people worked, um, makes you think about even perhaps the kind of coal or the sort of stones along um, railroad tracks, you know, in between the ties and on uh, between the rails, um, the idea of the Underground Railroad, um, maybe trains that took people from south to north or south to the Midwest or south to the west on trains. And he's also working with the pun of the idea of train and coal, meaning like John Coltrane. And perhaps the Thunderbird also um, uh, is an allusion to another great um, bebop jazz musician, Charlie Parker, whose nickname was the Bird, Bird Parker. So, you know, this is the kind of um, history that, um, despite what he might be saying about hating a certain kind of art history that Hammonds is obviously aware of, as well as, um, insisting that he's going to insert himself in it, not only to match it, but maybe to, to beat it. Yes, exactly, Veronica. Hyman's titles are important to understanding his work. Yes, there was a wine called Night Train, absolutely Myra as well. So the last couple of images before we end for tonight, um, I wanted to just bring to your attention um, the ways in which another artist um, like Hammonds, um, like Douglas, um, like uh, Shoni Barre um, is studying the idea of um, what is not only perhaps things of African descent in terms of culture, but also um, what is the diasporic culture look like as well. So we're looking at on in slide number 16, I hope, Dimitri. Um, the poster for um, the film Daughters of the Dust from 1991 um, by the New York born director, um, Julie Dash, um, a photograph of Dash um, on a set there as well. Um, and, you know, in terms of the key words that um, we talked about at the beginning, um, among them was um, narrative. And I don't know how many folks have seen Daughters of the Dust. I watched it again um, in preparation for tonight. I remember when it came out, I'm showing my age um, and what a big deal it was because there's a narrative um, in Daughters of the Dust. It's a narrative of, you know, family tensions. It's a narrative of a place. Um, you know, the islands um, off of uh, Georgia and South Carolina. Um, and it's about um, narratives in terms of um, family secrets and histories, um, as well as the rituals, both the ones that they are participating of in um, their present, which is the early 20th century, um, as well as things that they remember um, being passed on to them or passed down to them. So there are there scenes that are about memory in that film, Daughters of the Dust, um, in terms of African words um, being taught to children, words from African languages. Um, um, you see scenes of people praying um, who are clearly supposed to be read as Muslims. Um, you see people in graveyards, so there's memories of families and ancestors, and even the idea that the dead may be dead, but they're never gone. So memory and narrative are really embedded in what's going on with um, 
Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust. Yes, and AJ Cinema as well, and Carrie James Marshall, great Eric. So among Julie Dash's crew for this film were um, um, Arthur Jaffa, known by his nickname, AJ, um, uh, and we know a lot more about Arthur Jaffa because of um, his most recent project. Um, and also Kerry James Marshall, the painter um, who's really come into prominence now, um, sold a painting for $20 million, I guess, to Spike Lee last year, had an exhibition, did a commission for SF MoMA years ago for their lobby, also was part of the team. and. Gosh, who else was on that team that I just saw when I was looking at the credits? It's like a set, a set of luminaries of um, artists coming of age, not just artists who were working in film and video like Dash, but um, artists who were painters, who were installation makers as well. Um, let's go to the last, second to last slide here. So um, let's look at the trailer, if we can, of um, Julie Dash's um, Daughters of the Dust. It's just one minute. What they got out there, Eddie Wyola? Life, child, the beginning of a new life. Just because we cross over to the mainland, it doesn't mean we don't love you. I can leave the soil, the soil. Because we from the sea, we came here in chains. When they go down in the water, they ain't never come up. And nobody can walk on water. I need to know that I can come and hold on to what I come from. A pass on us. You think you can cross over to the mainland and run away from it? Never forget who we is and how far we done come. We can go back to the slide. Yellow Mary, so, I'd like you to meet. Whoops. So yeah, if you get a chance to watch um, Daughters of the Dust before um, our class um, next week or any time in the future, um, I think you'll enjoy seeing it because of some of the ways in which she's the symbolism of the film in terms of the photography and the location um, chosen, um, I hope resonates with what I've been saying tonight about um, Dash being among these 20th century artists who really is trying to, from her research and her study, create an idea of a, an African diaspora. That is to say a diaspora that is bringing um, ritual and custom and language and music and religion to um, the Americas, um, not unlike the ways in which um, perhaps um, Shoni Barre was trying to do um, in terms of his installation work and to some extent um, Douglas was trying to do in his painting. Um, and you know, of course, Dash's uh, work has, be has been so influential. Um, uh, Dimitri, could you hit um, the uh, advance button uh, so we can see? I hope there's an image up. Yeah, great. So some of you may recognize this as a still um, from uh, anybody you want to say. Yeah, Antoinette. Yeah. So um, um, I'm not going to play the trailer for um, Lemonade. Um, but yeah, exactly. We would see, as Maria points, as uh, Maria Porges point out, we would see a very distinct difference between the way um, uh, a trailer looks for uh, Lemonade um, made in the 21st century as opposed to uh, Julie Dash's. But we can obviously see that um, Beyonce and her crew, her director of photography, amongst them, um, 
uh, Khalil Joseph, I think, was on her crew for Lemonade. Um, and he's um, clearly someone who has been studying um, uh, Daughters of the Dust and probably worked by others who were trying to configure this idea of an African diaspora. Um, and this idea that the film, um, as Beyonce's video albums do, can break genres. So it's not exactly a narrative film and it's certainly not a documentary. It's not exactly like an essay film, it, but it's experimental in another way. Um, you know, this is part of uh, the sort of, I think, influence of Dash's um, film and her legacy. Um, uh, if we go, um, the other thing I want us to think about in the ways that with Julie Dash is her insistence that, you know, the Black experience um, and maybe even Black experiences can be central and visible in film and video. And here's um, a still from Arthur Jaffa, who, as I said, was uh, Julie Dash's um, collaborator. He was the director of photography on Daughters of the Dust um, from his recent um, very much celebrated film called Love is the Message, The Message is Death of 2016 um, and the ways in which these films are certainly part of this um, new kind of installation of um, video in the museum that is dynamic, sometimes multi-screened, et cetera. Um, yeah, definitely um, Khalil has been influenced by these makers. So as we finish up tonight, I wanna take any last questions. I think we'll be wrapping it up or comments. But um, if we just go to that very last um, slide 18, just to think about the things that we talked about in these first two weeks of the class, um, that is to say, you know, these ideas of diaspora as the movement of people, ideas of culture that are made and are certainly uh, proclaimed the mafa as this term that is seen to displace and for some people meant to replace the idea of the transatlantic slave trade, this idea of disaster. The Black Atlantic is something that um, is not just about the passage of people of African descent from Africa to Europe and the Americas, but the Black Atlantic as something that conceptualizes culture even after the end of the historical slave trade and the transactions and the exchanges um, among people of African descent as well as the cultural production. Um, I put in here as well art by African Americans, which I prefer as opposed to African American art. Um, and I hope we can talk more about this um, as we move forward. And the things that we talked about today, authenticity, genre, memory, found objects, mixed media, art, history, and experience. Um, just some of the artists that we talked about, remember the um, Ellis Island um, photographer, Augustus Sherman, who um, was making photographs of some of the arrivals um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And I showed you some um, photographs of um, women from Martinique and Guadeloupe, um, some who stayed in the United States, others who went on their way to um, Canada for work. Um, Denise Tomasos, the um, 20th century painter who passed away sadly um, a couple of years ago in terms of her idea of the African diaspora and the painting I showed you that was supposed to both evoke the holes of um, ships carrying the enslaved but all their places of confinement. Um, we talked today about Shelly Barre and Douglas as well as Hammonds, uh, Duchamp, Leonardo, uh, Julie Dash, Beyonce, and Jaffa. And don't forget some of the scholars that we talked about, um, Zora Neale Hurston, um, Catherine Dunham, both a scholar and a performer, Hurston, a scholar and a, a novelist, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, a scholar in terms of double consciousness, um, brief mention of Franz Fanon and C.L.R. James, but also interested in culture of the Black Atlantic that Paul Gilroy takes up in his study um, in of the Black Atlantic, even though he talks a lot about music. And in passing, um, Malana Karenga, um, who um, is a contemporary scholar who is criti uh, critiquing the ideas of um, the Mafa. He's like wanting it to be extremely um, clear that how many millions of people um, were both exploited as well as died as a result of um, racialized capitalism. 
And then lastly, some of the, um, uh, the mediums of art, the practices and the platforms and the formats that we've talked about already. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, um, one of the things that I, I want, I hope we can think about is um, as, you know, you've all brought a lot of um, knowledge to this, both as artists yourselves, as writers, as scholars, um, some of you collectors, um, and certainly people who um, like thinking and looking at art um, is, you know, if you were going to start thinking about a, an exhibition of work of the Black Atlantic, how would you start to curate that? Um, would some of the artists we've talked about today be in um, a historical or contemporary um, um, exhibition and why? What sort of themes interest you and um, make you want to think more about them? Are there connections? Are there contradictions? Are there paradoxes? Are there parallels? Um, would it be about um, um, the time period in which they worked? Um, would it be about the difference between time periods? So, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, at least maybe next week too, we can start to think about, you know, some of the sort of things that have been percolating for you, maybe as a result of this class or maybe even before. And um, maybe we can share a little bit more about um, the idea of an exhibition. And it doesn't have to be a huge survey of thousands of works. It could be, um, you know, 12 works. I just picked a dozen. Anyway, thanks so much, everybody. Um, I really enjoyed um, the comments and the feedback and um, looking forward to talking next week. Thank you, Jackie. This is awesome.